Hey everybody, what's up? It's Chase. Welcome to another episode of the Chase Jarvis Live Show here on Creative Live. You all know the show. This is where I sit down with the best humans in the world and I do everything I can to unpack their brains with the goal of helping you live your dreams, whether that's in career, in hobby, or in life. My guest today, you will recognize her immediately when I say the first thing out of my mouth, which is she wrote Eat, Pray, Love a, a, a considerable time ago. Then she was named one of the most 100 influential people in the world by Time Magazine. We're here today to talk about creativity, to talk about building a living and a life that you love, and her new book called City of Girls. My guest is the inimitable Elizabeth Gilbert. Welcome to the show. Hi, Chase. Hi. That was a very dramatic introduction. Ta-da! <laughs> like, ta <laughs> Let's put on a show. Um, um, thank you for having me in. Thank you so much. Congrats on your new book. Thank you. A novel. A novel, yeah. Yeah, that's my roots. Um, I, know, I, know. I know. Yeah, it's, uh, it's funny because I think it's very cute when people come up to me and they say, I loved your first book so much. And I'm like, what does that I mean? don't think you loved my tiny obscure collection of literary short stories that I published in 1995. <laughs> I you think really you're thinking, thinking like about Eat, Pray, Love. You're thinking of like, I've written a, but I did get my start in fiction and um, this is uh, my my fourth work of fiction. It's just, I love it. It's so fun for me. It's my home. Do you feel um, like, did, did you feel like you went back to it or was it just always, and, and was it, is it fair to say that you wrote a nonfiction book about creativity last time for just, be, was that the deviation and your, your roots and your line? Is, I guess it's just like, Project to project, I, I don't know. I just follow the magnet in the sky that tells me what the next thing to do is. And, um, and I don't overthink it too much about what the genre is. It's like, what is the story that I want to tell? What is the best form in which to tell it? And, and this is a novel about promiscuous girls, which is a story I've wanted to tell for a long time. It's, about, it's set in New York City in the 1940s in the theater world, but it's really a book about um, girls behaving really recklessly with their sexuality and not being ruined by it, which is not an easy book to find in the annals of Western history because normally yeah, the an, sensual girls Did you write ruined. this as an antidote? I to did. All? Okay, yeah, it's like, a, it's like a palate cleanser from Anna Karenina. <laughs> it's like, guess what? Because like, I feel like all those books are, I love all those books, Anna Karenina and all the Henry James books and, and, and um, Emma Bovary and Hedda Gabler and there's this whole history of books about ruined women um, ending in disgrace because they dared to have sensual desire. And I'm like, so unfair. It's like one orgasm and then you're under the wheels of the train, you know? So, um, so I wanted to write a book sort of celebrating how you can do very stupid and reckless sensual things and actually survive yourself um, and turn into a really interesting seasoned older woman, which is what this book's about. Is there, can we, can we make logical extensions from that? Or is it just about sexuality? What's your, your point here? Is it just the sexuality part? It's, um, how do you become yourself? That's also what the book is about. Yeah. You know, it's about a, a young girl moving to New York in 1940 when she's 19. Um, after failing out of college. After dropping out of college. I moved to New York in 1986 when I was 19, not to drop out of college, but I know the feeling of being young, hungry, yearning, craving, and wanting to know where are my people, where is my tribe, and where am I going to go to become this thing that I want to be, and I don't even know what it is yet. Um, but I'm drawn somehow to this metropolis or that metropolis or this answer or that answer. So it's a it's a coming of age book as well. There's a, a line in there I, I I might get one or two words wrong, but it, it was remarkable to me. You can only move to New York as a young woman once. Yeah, you just get to move to New York for the first time in your life once in your life. <laughs> and it's a big deal, yeah. it's a big, big deal. So what parts uh, of the book are, um, are, are memoir driven? Yeah. And is it, is it just weaving in and out of your life or is it specifically fiction? It's fiction because it's a novel, but it, you know, if you want to know who I am, read it. Um, that was yeah. what I would say about all of my novels because it's they, there's an adage, and I think it's wise and true, that if you want to write an honest memoir, write a novel. And the reason is you're not protecting yourself from anything. Yeah. Um, so you get to actually tell, if not the actual letter of the lost story, the feeling. Like this book is about what it felt like for me to be in my 20s. Um, it doesn't matter that it's in the 1940s and that it involves showgirls in the New York yeah. City theater world. It's I know what that feels like to be that girl. And, um, and that's something that I wanted to revisit and recreate. Why that is the backdrop? Was that a, just because it was a time where 
all of these things were more taboo, or why did why did you choose? And the theater, yeah. it said in the theater world, uh, Vivian. Actually, I probably shouldn't say too much about the book because you should go read it. But she moves to New York and yeah. she gets wrapped up in the theater world because of her aunt Peg. And is is that is it theater and creativity because that connotes a specific something that you wanted about the character? And I don't know. Your you know, you're on it. You're, you're, you got yeah. it. I mean, it's first of all, it's New York City in the 1940s, and that to me just feels like the most impossibly glamorous moment of yeah. my city's history. It's, um, you know, we all. I love the New York that I moved to, but there's always a shadow of a New York that used to be there that I've always been fascinated with. So New York during the war is a really interesting moment for me. It's also a really interesting moment for women in New York, particularly because they were working. Um, the men were all gone, and so all these social mores that had existed that were really limiting to women were gone. When the men left, so did the mores. Um, and so there used to be rules like a respectable girl cannot walk down the street unless she, after a certain time of evening if she's not on the arm of a respectable man. Well, there weren't any men. <laughs> you know. So all of a sudden these women were free um, and they had jobs working in, in the naval yard and they were earning good money. And there was just this moment of freedom and opening. It closed after that, like the 50s came the men came back and the women were sent yeah. back home and yeah. to wear big dresses and pearls and wait for their husbands to come home. But there was this period during the war and there's a line in the book where Vivian says, one thing that I learned with my girlfriends was that when women are together with no men around, a woman doesn't have to be this thing or that thing, she can just be. And I feel like New York in the 40s was a time when there were a lot of women who could just be. Um, and that's like an aspirational thing for me too, is like, what would it be like to be a woman who could just be? Just be. Just be. Not have to be a thing, yeah. just be. And does that come out of, uh, it, it, going back to the comment earlier about this being an antidote, yeah. is implicit in that, that we, we, the, in this book you can just be, is that all also an, antidotal to the world that we're in today where we have to be, you know, you can list a long list of things of who we're supposed to be and who we're supposed to dress like and look like and wear and talk and walk and. How many free people do you know? Like truly free. Very few. Yeah, me neither. And how many relaxed people do you know? Also very few. How many relaxed women have you ever met in your entire life? Handful. Yeah. <laughs> right? That's what I'm into. Is like, what would it be? And this is the question that I'm living into in my own life as well. Yeah. Like, I think the most revolutionary thing that a woman could be in this world or any is relaxed. Um, so my book is largely about a woman becoming that. You know, I think if you're going to meet one ever, she's likely to be older, like considerably older, where it just gets to a point where they're like, ah, oh, fuck it. <laughs> you know, like, I just like, I can't, I just can't anymore. Yeah. You know, like I used to, eh, I just can't, you know, there's a certain age that a woman will get to and I'm, I feel like I'm on the brink of it, but I'm not quite there yet. But, but my greatest aspiration, aside from being my really greatest aspiration, which is to be love in every room that I'm in, my other aspiration is to be, the most relaxed person in every room that I'm in. Um, and, wow. and to actually show women what it might look like to be at ease. Is, is <laughs> that a response to an earlier and different time in your life? Well, I've been a really high vibrationally anxious person my whole life, but I also see that everyone is. Um, and this is also a moment in history where I think um, anxiety is nearly universal. Um, it's, it's just peak. It's Every, peak. It's like it's, Everywhere in the world. Yeah. Everywhere in the world. I mean, it's a, it's a product of, of Westernization and it's a product of like, when I first went to Bali you know, 15, 20 years ago, it wasn't like that. I'm there now, Balinese people are stressed now. I was like, we have exported this, it's a fucking virus. Like yeah. stress right. is this virus that has, has somehow colonized the world and it's killing everybody. Yeah. And there's really, really good empirical reason for it. I mean, we, we are like, you know, in the approaching Armageddon, <laughs> welcome yeah. to the catastrophe yeah, of a God. dying planet. And like the dumpster fire that is politics, all of that is true. And if you walk around in this world as, as ever in a woman's body, that's all heightened because you're always in a sort of sense of, of danger. And yet there's some stubborn part of me that's like, yeah, but what if I just didn't drink your anxiety lemonade? Um, and what if I found my own way to be in my own skin where I was okay always, no matter what? Um, wouldn't that be something? And <laughs> wouldn't that actually really be something? How, how's that going? It's going better than it's ever gone in my life, you I know? Mean, we're meeting today for the first time. Yeah. You greeted me with a huge hug. Yeah. We've been friends for a long time. Yeah. Is that part of the, the universe that you're trying to lean into? I mean, that's kind of just, just how, what I'm, me too. I'm like basically a golden retriever. 
<laughs> so like, I've been described as that. So we're the same. We share the same birthday. We just figured that. I know out we're also. super sensitive yes, Cancerians. Right. Right. We just wish everyone would be in a pile together yeah. on the yeah. floor. Mm -hmm. So that's part of that's what, like, what my nature. <laughs> why why is everyone not hugging all that's the right. time? Um, but that that's my nature. But to feel comfortable and relaxed, um, it takes a lot of really radical. It's an interesting pathway. It takes foundational, unbelievable honesty. Um, you have to you have to kind of be telling the truth all the time, um, which is weird because you would think that wouldn't be relaxing. But what it does in the end is it gives you a lot more time and space to uh, not be doing the hustle. You know, like yeah. that that's like a line I'm guided by is that grace can take you places where hustling can't. Um, and and at the center of grace is just this integrity of great, like great, just great truth telling. This isn't working for me. Like this thing that this situation saying no. Like, but saying it just like, it's okay. It's like, yeah, you can ask, but no. <laughs> I spend most of my day saying no. That's yeah. a large part of me learning how to be relaxed. Just and like, nope. uh, when, when you're talking truth, is that truth to yourself? Is that truth to other? Presumably it's both, but to what degree did you start, did this start to take shape? Is it what you, you, you realized that you were your, a, a better self when you started talking truth to yourself first and then that manifest itself outwardly or was it you had to start being really honest with people about external commitments and that gave you this space and the freedom to get hmm. internal well you should definitely try to have a completely honest relationship with at least one person in your life and probably best if it's yourself yeah <laughs> it's a good place to start yeah. like i i can't I can't speak anybody else's truth, you know? And I was guided by this really like schooled in this intimately for years in my relationship with my, um, my partner, Rhea, who died a year and a half ago before we were together as a couple, we were best friends. And she had been a heroin addict and a speedball junkie on the Lower East Side, just in Rikers Island in years living on the streets in prisons. She just had this really horrific, brutal early life. And she ended up astonishingly getting clean and staying clean for, for 19 years. Um, and her path to that was, of course, truth-telling, which is the cure for addiction, yeah. not cure, but treatment. Yeah. Um, and, and she embodied it in this really remarkable way. And she had an adage, and she was the person in the world I was always most relaxed around because she only ever told the truth. So you always knew where you were. Yeah. You would never had to guess. And everyone in the room was safe because Rhea was always telling the truth. Whatever bullshit what else was going on, there was yeah. like one center, very like dense gravitational truth telling always happening. Um, but the line that she lived by, and she she passed it to me, and now I live by it because I can't not. Is um, she used to say, "The truth has legs. It's the only thing that's going to be left standing in the room at the end of the day. Everything else will blow up. Everything else will disintegrate. Everything else will dissolve into drama. The truth is where you're going to end up, inevitably. So since it's where we're going to end up." Why don't we just start with it and then save time. and save the drama? Yeah. Like let's I, I, just now I get the time comment. Start with it, yeah. and that's like I've had I've repeated that with people so many times where I'm like, well, why don't we just begin with it? You know, like create a judgment free zone, start with it, and it saves your life because it saves like so much pain and agony and drama. You, if there's pain to be had, you, let's just do it now. Yeah, um, and 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 that's been transformative to me, and and actually has made me be a more relaxed person. I think when I was younger, I used to think, I can't tell the truth because the world isn't safe. It's not a safe place for the truth or for my truth. And now I've realized you make the world a safe place for you by telling the truth in it. That's how your world becomes safe, is through your own honesty. Brilliant. When did you start that process? Um, like around the time I turned 30, because the first major truth that I had to tell the first truth that I didn't tell for a long time and, and didn't know how to tell and thought the, that birds would drop dead out of the sky and rivers would run backwards if I'd said it, um, was that I didn't want to be married anymore and I didn't want to have a baby. And, um, and I had gotten married very young at 24 and had promised my then husband that when I was 30, I would settle down and stop being a traveler and have a baby and buy a house. And um, instead, I lost my mind. <laughs> 30 came and that wasn't... I lost my mind because I couldn't... My, what ended up happening and what will end up happening when you don't tell the truth is that your body will break down. My 
my physical body actually broke. My mental health broke down and my physical health broke down. Um, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I lost 20 pounds. Like this is what not truth does to you. Um, until there was really, I mean, you get to a, a place where it's like die or tell the truth. Yeah. And I finally did. And, um, and instead of making me die, it brought me to life. Um, and he survived it, you know, um, and, and if I had fucking said it two years earlier, it would have been a much greater gift to him yeah. as well. I, I'd have cost him two years of his life while I couldn't say those words. So that was my biggest lesson in you're not doing anybody any favors by holding this in. Like if there's something that you know about yourself that if an intimate person in your life knew they would change their whole life, they should know. Like you're not doing them any favors by not telling them that. The sooner you tell them that, the sooner they have agency over their life again to figure out what they need to do now. And that's been a game changer. That's like a power pellet that I just got from you right there. <laughs> well, I'm just like, <laughs> you know, uh oh. <laughs> it's intense, but it's wow. like, you know, I think we a lot of times we we lie and dissemble and manipulate, especially Cancerians like us, because mm -hmm. we're people pleasers. But when I actually discovered what the real, what you should actually call a people pleaser yeah. is a people manipulator. Um, and that's what a people pleaser does is they manipulate people for their own safety. Uh -huh. You know, they're not pleasing other people. They're keeping themselves perceived as safe. And, um, and, and you're not doing the other person any favors by doing that. They should know who they're talking to and they should know what's actually going on. What role does this play in creativity? Your big yeah. magic, your previous book, it's a lot about fear, it opens about talking about how you were afraid of, I think you basically say you're afraid of everything. Everything. As a young person. Yeah, and afraid of you had parents, everything. and, and it wasn't your mom that eventually like, uh, like I think you say kicked you in the butt or something. She like never indulged my fear for yeah. like a single minute. <laughs> like she was like, God. she was like, how did I get this kid? This like terrified bundle of nerves is what I was born into. Um, truth telling and creativity, it's an interesting question. I haven't, I haven't thought about that. I mean, I think um, I was always a creative person. I, it was often an escape for me. Uh, it, was a, it was a place to go and run to and hide. I liked my imagined worlds better than the real one. Yeah. Um, in school and in, in school, playtime? In school, at home. And, you know, I grew up on a farm. There was a lot of work to be done. I was with, like, grew up with really pragmatic, responsible people. There was a lot of intense responsibility put on me from an early age. And so escaping into a dream world was way preferable to being here yeah. um, in, in this place, in this very cold farmhouse with a lot of chores and a lot of jobs um, and a lot of expectation that you should be able to know how to do everything already. Um, so for me, I think my early creativity was escape, but I, I think as you're saying, I'm just kind of spitballing as you're saying this, but I think people ask me all the time why Eat, Pray, Love was so successful. And I always say, I don't know, but it could be that it's, it's a story of a woman learning how to tell the truth. Um, it's a story like that is what happens in the first pages of Eat, Pray, Love is that here's this woman sobbing on the bathroom floor for the 90th consecutive night in the middle of the night, unable to say the words, I don't want to be married anymore, who finally says those words. Um, and that is the beginning of like my actual adult life. Um, so I think maybe that creative truth telling can be liberating for a lot of people, not just for the person doing it. Yeah. And does it, uh, for you, did that truth telling unlock a new world of possibilities, a new world of creativity? A new, what do you feel like it unlocked? What it unlocked it? two years of, of highly uh, medicated depression. <laughs> So you got that to look forward to, I all mean, this truth-telling. The way is hard. Yeah. The way is hard. I mean, like yeah. Joseph Campbell says, you have to give up the life that you plan to have the one that's waiting for you. But when you give up the life you have planned and you don't know what's waiting for you, there's an interim where there's no ground under your feet. And yeah. um, I also love that the great, great spiritual writer, Stephen Mitchell and translator, who's, who's translated the Bhagavad Gita beautifully in the Tao Te Ching and who's a Zen practitioner himself. And he says, you know, the way, the great way, um, involves this first the rug gets pulled out from under you and then the floor gets pulled out from under the rug and then the ground gets pulled out from under the floor and now you're getting somewhere now you now you're getting somewhere you're getting somewhere to the recognition that there is no ground <laughs> there is no ground and that is the beginning but but it's awful yeah. to feel that when you thought you had security and you thought you had something fixed and then there's like ooh, you're like you know, a, a, a Warner Brothers cartoon character running over a cliff, 
and all of a sudden, like, you know, there's that thing that yeah, happens. Wild coyote. Yeah, yeah, and um, and your friend and mine, Brene, and I have talked about how, you know, we live in a culture that bandies around this very easy kind of ideas, like jump and the net will catch you. But all yeah. of us know that we've jumped and and like broken ten bones. Yeah, you know, bounced. Yeah, yeah, Hard. or or not even yeah. bounced. Or splatted. You know, yeah. left an imprint in the cement. You yeah. know, and we all know that there are. You know, this is a. I'm not sure we come to this world because it's safe. Um, I'm not sure that it's meant to be particularly safe. Um, so I think I think we do a disservice when we try to inspire people by saying, "Yeah, just do it, man. Just go for it," as if there's no consequences, no cost, and, yeah. and no, no difficulty in that. And and so I'm always really careful to say, "Yeah, yeah I jump said and it's gonna suck. Jump and it sucked for two years, yeah. you know, and then." I slowly, slowly, excruciatingly, with a lot of help, um, found my way, um, and and that's how it works, you know. So what's the relationship between? Uh, I was struck by something you just said, and it made me think of vulnerability, uh, because when you're, you know, there's the floor there, you're gonna hit, and if truth telling is truth telling a path. To vulnerability with it, which is a path to something else, or what's the relationship between? Um, because do you have to be vulnerable to tell the truth? Yeah, I mean, especially if you're telling a truth that you are afraid is going to hurt another person, and you're an empath. Yeah, um, I mean, that's the most devastating. Those are the most devastating truths I've ever had to tell, and and I am an empath, you know. So so I'm sitting with you in the pain I just brought to you because of the truth that I have to tell you. That is the seventh circle of health for yeah. me. Um, you know, and the only reason that I do it is because life in all of its grace has been kind enough to teach me through brutal lesson that the other, all the other ways are worse. Yeah. <laughs> like this is the seventh circle of hell, but all the other things that aren't this are, are the eighth circle of hell that there's no, it's like the domain of oblivion in which no one is, no one, no one is safe. Um, and, and so there's a tremendous faith that has to come in believing that the real is the right way, even if it doesn't look like it in this moment. And, and to stop arguing with reality and to figure out how are we gonna now live in accordance with reality, you know? Um, this is the reality. So now how do we, what are we gonna do? Um, rather than, let's pretend this isn't the reality. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let me take whatever drugs I have to take to pretend that this isn't the reality. You go do whatever you have to do to hide to pretend that this isn't the reality. And then let's just see where that leads. Um, yeah. and, and I can't, I, I, what, the one thing I've discovered about myself is that's a grace and it's horrible as it's happening. My being, my actual being will not allow me to stay in a situation where I'm out of my integrity anymore. I will get, I will break down mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Um, and I will be back on that bathroom floor. And, and eventually I'll be beaten down to the point where I have to start telling, and I'm like, fuck, do I have to tell the truth again? Yeah. And now you're just like, I'm sure oh, it's circling that. I'm oh, not I, gonna... thought I, had, I thought I did this already. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. Like you think you did it once and you're done, yeah. but like life again in all her grace, it's like, now I'm going to give you another chance. Here's a gift. Here's a gift. Now's another chance for you to be really brave um, and to know that the only way out is through honesty. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. And it's getting easier, honestly, um, because I trust it now. Um, I trust it. You mentioned uh, stepping into some of this truth telling um, at the age of 30. Yeah. Uh, what role did Rhea play in? Did, is this another like you 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 went you did a couple of the cycles that we just described yeah. between thirty and forty six yeah and and your experience with the partner that you loved dying from cancer what how did that was that the do you feel like you finally learned you know what it is truth? is that so she's the most important person of my history um, she was my the great love of my life and also my great teacher and my great friend. Um, and she, and the reason that I gravitated to her, and it, and it took years for that 
to develop. You were friends for a long time. We were time. friends for a long time. We were acquaintances for a long yeah. time, and then we became friends, and then we became dear friends, and then we became best friends. And then for about four or five years there, I didn't even know what to call her. I just called her my person. Even though I was married and very loyal and faithful in my marriage, this was my person. My person to me meant who do I call? Who's my first phone call in every emergency? Yeah. Who's my first phone call when I need advice? Who's my first phone call when I want to celebrate? Who knows everything about me? You know, um, who, who do I feel? Who is the one person in the world who I feel completely safe around? And it was Rhea. And the panic, the existential panic and terror and horror that I experienced at her diagnosis, knowing that that person where, I mean, I can still feel in my body what it felt like for all those years when Rhea would walk into a room and my whole body would relax because I'd be like, Rhea's here, it's all gonna be okay. She's got it. Because she was so tough and strong also, but so, and so loving. She was, in every room she ever walked into, the strongest person in the room. And, and so I was, I just wanted to be around her so that I could feel that safety. Yeah. And what I realized, I got this panic the first year of her illness. I had this urgent craving panic where I was like, I have to download you I have to download you because I don't know how to do life without you. And I need to learn quickly. I had thought I had time to learn how to be like her, but I was like, I gotta, I gotta get it all in me now yeah. because no one else can. That's right. Yeah. Help. I basically yeah. became an addict of like wanting to shoot, smoke, like inhale, eat, yeah. like imbibe her. And what ended up happening is that as she got sicker and, and as her, terror, her own terror and fear grew. Um, and she couldn't take care of me anymore that way. Yeah. Um, I had to become her, to take care of her. Um, and, and what I've realized, um, my beloved friend Martha Beck said after Rhea died, she, what I've seen happen to you two over the years is now she's braided into you and you have an essential DNA strand of Rhea now. Um, and and that is the download. Um, but it's, it didn't come the way I thought it was gonna come. It didn't come from her teaching it to me empirically. It came from me having to step up. That's what I said at her memorial service too, because she was that role in a lot of people's lives. There were probably 10 people who would have said she was the most important person in their life that they couldn't live without. Wow. And I said, well, what was, what's now asked of us is that we all have to step up and we all have to be that now. Um, and, and I find that I, I can truly say that I am. Yes, you're, you're what's looked from the outside as just this in, amazing, courageous stepping into the sharing of the process mm. was so powerful from where I was sitting. Mm. Uh, do you feel like that was part of your assignment? Is that like the, this process that you're talking about of weaving the strand of DNA mm. through her, her last uh, weeks and months? that like, I don't know, is that, is that part of your assignment? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think it's always been part of my assignment. Okay, maybe assi I think assignment is grandiose because it, I'm not sure, I don't know how the universe works. I'm not sure I know what my assignment is, but I will say this, I will say that the moment, the distance in time and space between the moment when I learn something that helps and saves me mm -hmm and how much time I can allow before I desperately want to put it out there in case somebody that day needs it, yeah. that's a very short time span for me. Um, and I feel it's that I have to, and I don't feel like I have to necessarily out of responsibility to them because again, I don't know if it's useful. I just know that it starts to hurt me to not share it. Yeah. It actually feels like pain. I remember my guru in India used to say, any talent that you have that you do not use becomes pain. Um, wow. But I also think any wisdom and insight that you have that you do not share becomes pain. Why in the world would I not share it? Like if I know so intimately what it's like to suffer, I know so intimately, intimately deeply in my bones and skin what it's like to not know what to fucking do. You know, so if I've been given like one little glimmer of light, why in the world would I not be like, you want this? Yeah. Hey, I got something for <laughs> because you, take I've, it. Yeah, I've been so helped by people yeah. who have been generous enough to learn in public. Yeah. You know, I think learning in public is such a generous thing for people to do because we look to it and we're like, Brene learns in public, Glennon learns in public, Cheryl Strayed learns in public, yeah. my friend Rob Bell, Martha Beck, they're all brave enough to, to learn in front of us so that we can 
maybe get something. There's a strong creative thread in a lot of the people that you just talked about, and I'm st I'm still trying to connect maybe um, poorly, but to connect creativity to that. And you're, if is that a mechanism for teaching? Is like your ability to write, your ability to write not just a novel or a nonfiction book, but a, a, an Instagram post. Mm -hmm. Is that your public teaching? Is this this like, is art your vehicle for teaching? Or what role does, does creativity play in that? Yeah, I mean, I guess it is. I didn't um, plan it to be. No you know? problem, you can take that away. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no. No, I'm like, no, I, I didn't plan I, it to be. Like, I did it because I wanted to do it. Yeah. And I still do it because I want to do it. And I still feel, I still truly do not feel the slightest bit of responsibility to my readers or my followers at all. And that's why I'm so relaxed with them and why I love them. Yeah. If I felt responsible to them, I think it would be really heavy on me and weirdly on them. Um, but I feel like I don't feel responsibility to you guys. I yeah. love you. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, but I don't feel the slightest bit of responsibility to you. So that means that I get to do whatever I want creatively and that you, my readers, get to decide whether you want to come with me, which is why like 12 million people came with me for Eat, Pray, Love, but when That's I wrote my novel, The Signature of All Things, about a 19th century botanical virgin who studies moss, like a couple hundred thousand people came with me on that. But it's elective, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. they, they don't have to, and I don't have to write Eat, Pray, Love again. Yeah. You know, like, everyone's free. That was part of your TED Talk, Everyone's right? free, when, yeah. When you really realize that uh, the most popular piece of work that you've written may be behind you. Yeah. But stepping into whatever is next for you is has to be authentically you, right? You it's can't gotta chase the be. Act. I can't do that again. I don't yeah. know how I did it the first time. You know, so so but the teaching came kind of after Eat Pray Love where I felt like people I think I think if you're called to be a, t a teacher, you'll know because people will keep asking you stuff. Um, and, and so like that's what that's happened. It's the most simple definition of a teacher. Right? right? Yeah. Like people will gravitate and be like, hey, what do you think about this? You know, and and at first I was really I was like, I'm just a, I'm just a dumb girl who went through, I can't, blah, blah, blah. but I feel like after a certain time, if people keep asking you something, it's really disingenuous to keep being like, oh, no, this is, yeah. you know, <laughs> did you like that sound? Um, <laughs> That's a good one. Actually. I think it's, I think you captured that, that, right? it's more check. respectful yeah. to actually take a swing at the question, you know, and say like, I'll take a swing at it. And if people ask me questions that are just beyond my pay grade, I'll send them elsewhere. Like if people ask me about how to work in the corporate world, I'll be like, go talk to Brene. I've never yeah. had a job. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. I was a bartender. Like I have no idea if they ask me about parenting. I'm like, Glennon's right over here, yeah. you know? Um, so I feel like we can, we all shuffle ourselves around to each other as well. Like this is probably a better question for you. Um, what, what role did that, I want to go back to yeah. that fear part that you opened Big Magic with. Yeah. The the connection between creativity and fear for you mm -hmm. and is that do you feel like that's common or is that like why why did you write Big Magic? I wrote Big Magic actually to because people kept asking me questions about creativity, especially after yeah. I gave that TED talk, yeah. and um and that is the one book that I could say that I honestly wrote precisely as a self help book because it's the one subject where I feel like. I actually know about this. Like, I'm completely comfortable talking to you and giving you advice about creativity. I've been doing this my whole life and I have a relationship with it that's a lot less tormented than most of the relationships that I see people having with creativity. So let me be an expert here, you know? <laughs> like, let me put on an expert hat and actually say, yeah, I'm a middle-aged woman, I've been doing this a long time. Let me tell you some stuff that I've learned. Um, but, but the fear piece is, I think, I think intensely sensitive people tend to experience fear and everything yeah. at a heightened level. I experience everything. I experience love and passion and lust and sorrow and, and despair. And like, you know, I like drop something on my foot and I experience it at a high level. It's all an opera around me, you know? So, so, so the fear <laughs> is just part of that. But, but my saving grace in the whole world and in myself is that as afraid as I am and I am, I'm like 1% more curious than I am afraid. Like, thank God when they doled out all these traits to me, they gave me a dose of curiosity that was just like, all it has to be is this much yeah. bigger than fear. It doesn't have to be a lot bigger. It just has to be enough bigger that it's worth it to take the risk because you're more interested than you are scared. And that's why I think that my working definition of, 
of create, creative living, not creativity in general, not meaning that you have to do watercolors or take a macrame class. If you want to live what I think of as a creative life, my definition of a creative life is any life where your decisions are routinely based more strongly on your curiosity than your fear every single day in all your realms of your life. Um, and then your life itself will become a work of art. And it doesn't matter what you make or produce or leave or influence. It's just that you will create a life that will be really interesting for you, which is it's beautiful. the person who you want to keep the most entertained. Yeah, right. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. I would imagine. What you said that you were very comfortable uh, giving advice on creativity. Yeah. So knowing, you know, you, you know, who's on the other side of these, uh, you know, we're in their ears right now and they're yeah. watching this video or listening to us um, without retracing all the steps of Big Magic because that's yeah. a 260 page book or whatever. What, what is the advice that you have for people? Because there's a lot of folks out there who are stuck or blocked or haven't started. They go from zero to one trying to figure it out for the, for the beginning or they're, they identify as creator and they're trying to go from one to ten. Mercy. I think is the fundamental word that is coming to me as a short answer to that question. Um, if you want to have a healthy engagement with creativity, if you want to have a healthy engagement with yourself, if you want to have a healthy engagement with others, mercy has to be at the foundation. Mercy for self, mercy for others, mercy for the inevitable disappointment that you're going to feel when you make something and it's not what you wanted it to be. Um, you know, uh, my beloved friend, Ann Patchett, the novelist, has this great way of describing this where she says like her favorite part of the creative process is when she's in the dreaming state of it and she gets to be alone with the idea for the novel and, and, and it follows her for years and she's thinking about it and it's growing in her head and it's with her when she's washing dishes, it's with her when she's going through the car wash, it's with her when she's at somebody's wedding. She's just constantly got this like lovely dream and in her imagination, the thing that she's going to make, she describes it as a tourmaline butterfly, like a butterfly made out of gems that it catches the light so beautifully, it's so exquisite, it's so perfect. This is gonna be the one, right? This is gonna be the one that when I make it, it's gonna, I'm gonna actually achieve that like platonic ideal of the thing and it's gonna be so beautiful. And then she says the worst part of the creative process is day one of making it. Because what you have to do is <laughs> so pluck the tourmaline butterfly out of the sky, put it on the desk, take a mallet and smash it into a thousand pieces and let it go because it can never exist. And then you make the approximation of your tourmaline butterfly, which is made out of like, like used chewing gum and baseball cards and like twigs, you know, and like a tin can and like a hinge. And you're like, here's my butterfly I made, you know, and it's like, wah, wah. And, like and you're like, I made it by myself. Look, it's, I did it. I did it. And, and I think the merciful artist, the merciful creator, the merciful human is the one who can say, you know, no one's ever made one like that before. <laughs> Good job, self. <laughs> and maybe there's a reason, but the boring thing would be if all the if we all made tourmaline butterflies. The interesting thing is, truly, no one's ever made one like that before. Yeah. And the mercy, and the empathy towards yourself, is what gets you. I always say that there's like on day one, everyone starts day one really excited about their project. Everyone on day two looks at what they made on day one and hates themselves. The only people who get to day three are the people who have mercy. Um, so beyond anything else, whether you're, and that is going to be the same, whether you are a master or a beginner, um, that is everyone's day three is where that's where the rubber meets the road. You're going to keep going and keep disappointing yourself or are you going to stop? And my suggestion is that you keep disappointing yourself and be very, very gracious toward yourself about it. <laughs> is, that, is that an aspect of bravery or is that curiosity or is it like, is it's it compassion. vulnerability, Compa self-compassion? It's compassion. Yeah. It's compassion, yeah. I mean, it's really the foundation of compassion, which says um, the imperfect is the perfect, you know. Um, Say more of that. Like that's, a, that's a pretty, that's a... Well, I mean, in a way, it's like the end of the argument. It's the end of the argument against reality, you know. Um, you know, the reality is you can't, make, you probably can't make the thing in the way that you dream it. Um, the end of the argument against the pain of that is, so what? Make it anyway. I'm gonna make my like, I'm gonna hatch my weird little 
steampunk butterfly. <laughs> it's pretty good. Tin cans, hinges, yeah. <laughs> bubblegum, baseball cards, and duct tape. Did you have duct tape in there? I, I don't know why I didn't, but <laughs> yours should. Um, you know, so, so that is, that is com- I think that putting yourself in alignment with reality rather than in a constant war against it is, is actually what compassion is. And that's also how you find compassion for the other, for the people in your life. Like instead of me needing you to constantly be an entirely different human being than you are, I can put myself in, in compassionate alignment with the reality of what you are. I can put myself in compassionate alignment with the reality of what I am. I want to be 10 different things than what I am today, but this is what we're working with. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is what we got. This is what we got. Flap, flap, peace falls off. Uh, this is what we got, you know? How do you do what you do right now? Because you're just like truth zingers. How, like, is it just repetition of the first time it's hard, second time it's 10% less hard, the third time it's, or 1% less hard? I don't know if anybody realizes what percentage of my life I spend taking care of my mental health. Like, that's my full-time job. And writing is a hobby that I do on the side. Every once in a while I write a book. The rest of my life, like an enormous percentage of my day is spent managing this neighborhood, warring neighborhood, (laughs) this like dysfunctional family that I carry inside of my mind. And I, everything that I've learned that has any taste of wisdom and grace is from the front lines of this, you know? And I mean it like today, I mean like, that's what I was doing on the plane today was managing my mental health today. Wow, wow. Like there are practices that I do every single day in order to keep myself happy and, and loved and connected. And I do them, I have to save my life every single day. Like wow. there's very few, I have very few days off from trying to save my own life. Um, so this is very immediate. Yeah. Yeah. what I'm talking about. Yes. I'm not talking about like what you have to do. I'm talking about what I do. On the so, way here, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what can you, I have to ask, like, yeah. what's the, how, what are the things? And I understand that. No, I don't mind talking about it because but, like, look, if, if it helps. Yeah. Um, well, there's you know, a lot of people who the, will take your guidance. The most important relationship that I have in my life is a dialogue that I launched 20 years ago between me and love, capital L, love that I have continued nearly every day of my life over the last 20 years. And it came in the deepest depression where, I mean, I want, I was in that like deep God-sized hole of just wanting somebody to comfort me, wanting somebody to save me, wanting somebody to make me feel safe and make me feel like it was okay. And I have beautiful people in my life, but like, no one, and I know this for a fact because I have looked for it, no one can handle that in me. <laughs> like, yeah. nobody. Um, because sometimes people have to sleep. <laughs> they have to get a sandwich <laughs> and they have to go to work. And I'm like, wait, <laughs> like, where are you going? You know, like, nobody. You have no idea how needy I am. Like, and I do. And, and so, and, I, and this was a period in my life where I was alone. And so what I did was sit down in the middle of the night in my slough of despair, take out a notebook. And this was this great leap of imagination. What would I, what are the words that I've always wanted to hear somebody say? Can I say it to myself? And I started writing those words to me. I am right here. I have got you. I will always have you. You are precious unto me. I don't care if you stay depressed for the entire rest of your life, I still love you. I don't care if you never fix this. I don't care if you never get better. I don't care if you never create another, I don't care if we live in a box under a bridge. I am yours, you are mine, I have got you, you are my boo. Like, I was with you when you were born, I will be with you till after you die, I will never leave you, you are mine, belonging, imprint, belonging, love, love, ownership, forever, you can't tire me out. You can't tire me out, we can do this all night. I will, you will get tired before I do. I love you so much. This is what I've always wanted to hear another human being say. And it's a little much to ask. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> and, and so uh. I've learned to bring it. And, and what I've, when I figured out what that voice is, it's love. It's, it's universal human love. And, and that is the most important relationship in my entire life. And I write a letter to myself from that every single day of my life.
Is it the number one vehicle? Is yep. writing yourself that love letter, yeah. capital L love? Yeah, and lots of times it's dialogue, yeah. you know, um, and, and the dialogue will go like me be like hysterical, I don't know what to do, it's all falling apart, I'm, I've failed again, I've lost again, I'm unlovable, I'm untenable, I'm unmanageable, I, I'm, I'm back at zero, help, 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 help. And love's like, always says exactly the same thing, it always begins with, I'm right here, I'm right here, I'm right here. I'm right here. I'm with you. I'm not going anywhere. I've got you. And then I will say, what should I do? And love will say, I don't know. That's not my department. <laughs> I just love you. And then I will say, tell me how this is going to end. And love will say, I have no access to that information, but I will be with you through it, whatever it is. And then I say, if you can't tell me what to do and you can't tell me how this is going to end, what the fuck use are you? And love says, I am company for you in your darkest hour, and I always will be. And that is my use. That is what I'm here for. And then I can begin to breathe. Wow. Begin to breathe. And I don't know whether that thing, that voice, is God talking to me, Rhea talking through me, angels on my shoulder, my heightened imagination that creates in its own trauma the thing it needs. I don't care. It works. <laughs> that works. It doesn't matter. It I'll works. Take it. And I've learned by being able to hold myself that way, I can also be, not with anyone, but I can be in the room with almost anyone at this point. Because I can just be like, I don't care if you ever sort this out. You're a wreck, I, but I'm right here. And they're like, what do I do? I'm like, I don't know, but I'll be with you. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll just be love in the room with you. And if they're like, it doesn't so help, powerful. I'm like, well, okay, but I'm here. I'll just sit here. You know, I mean, like the thing about that I've learned about love, real, capital L love about that over the years is that love, real love, doesn't need anything in the room to be different than it is. Doesn't need anything to be different than it is. It never says, here's what you have to go do now. Here's how you have to change. Here's how you have to grow. Doesn't need it. Doesn't need it. Way, way more powerful. Yeah. It's like, you just, you just keep doing this and I'm just right here. I got you. And that's, that is how I have survived my life. Is the manifestation always writing or are there any other tools that you use? Writing is the thing. You know, I think it's the most direct for me. I can't, it slows the mind down. You know, um, most of us, I mean, all of us, we have minds that move at just the speed of light, literally, or more. Now I guess nothing's faster than that. Thoughts move really, 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 really fast. So writing slows it. So I can bring my panic to the page and say, I have this very deliberate question, help. And then love will say, I got you, I'm right here. It's okay, it's gonna be all right. Um, it's going to be all right, even though it's not. Even if it's not, it's going to be all right. So when you mentioned being on the plane, were you writing to yourself on the plane? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not kidding when I say I do this every day. Yeah. No, like, I, I, like, I, I is, think these, these foundational practices yeah. are, are, it's a really common thread in greatness and creativity. And yeah. there's a self-care that, uh, I think it's a, it's a complete myth, this sort of horrified artist who's trying to dive into that in a in an unhealthy way, that healthy way of trying to manage it that you're talking about. Yeah. It's gonna I have no interest in being a tormented artist or a tormented person. Yeah. I often am one, but when I am, I will do anything I can to help myself get out of it as fast as I can or to reach to somebody who can help me. Um, I mean, I will, I will relentlessly, you know, this is one of the things that love says to me all the time is I will make sure you get whatever you need, whatever care you need, we will make sure you get it. We will make sure you get it starting tomorrow. I, I, I read a thing that you scrapped an entire novel. Is that, is that true? <laughs> well, it wasn't a novel. It was a memoir, but I did. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Was but a lot of people have Was it Was it like, why would you do that? It was the book that came after Eat, Pray, Love. And it was like torment. It was just so tortured because it was so self-conscious because I was like, I'm the author who wrote Eat, Pray, Love now. Like I just yeah. had no natural voice in it. Yeah. And it was just strangled. Like every sentence felt really strangled. And, um, and I put it, I mean, it wasn't an easy thing. It made me, like I wept and wept when I realized that I was so off. And I also realized this is not worth even trying to save. And it was a very painful truth telling moment to my publishers to say, yeah. guess what I have for you? Nothing. Nothing. And you can't see what I've done. And I can't tell you when I'm gonna have something. And I don't know what, if ever. And then I spent the next year gardening. Um, and without a plan and just like faith. I'm just going to do something else now. I'm just going to plant things. I don't know. And it wasn't like, I'm going to do this and then I'll have a great idea. It was like, I'm just going to do this. <laughs> like, this is fun. 
water plant, watch it grow. This is very fundamental. It's a lot easier than writing a book. Wow. Literally grounding, yeah. getting your hands in the dirt, you know? Um, and then like by the end of that season of the garden, like inspiration started to come back and I found it. And but I didn't know I would. I just- You have to believe that. Yeah, this is, yeah. yeah. How do you know the work to do when you don't know what work to do? Something else. Yeah, just like anything else. <laughs> yeah. Like if it's over there, you run the other. Something right. else, and yeah. I would suggest doing something with your hands. Um, yeah, you know, we're, I have that sense of we're in our too. heads yeah. so much, and, and most of us at this moment in history, we're so disconnected from our bodies and from the world, and um, we really do think of our bodies as like a broomstick that we carry a jar with our brain yeah. in it around yeah. on. You know, and, and so um, I would say anything that you can do to embody work, um, whether it's exercise or to um, to make something. There's, Physicality. There's, I love yeah. that story. There's this author, Clive, Clive James, this British author, and I tell this story in, in Big Magic. He had an enormous failure where he took bank, literally bankrupted his family to, to produce a play that ill-advisedly was a play that mocked every single literary person in London living at that time who were all his friends. So he lost all his money and he lost all his friends. And it was terrible. And you didn't see this coming? No, because he was like a <laughs> he was like that cool guy who everything he touched turned to gold and he thought it would be really funny. Oof. And it was actually just rancid. And um and he fell into a severe depression for months and couldn't even get off the couch. And then one day his little daughter came in and said, Daddy, um, uh, she, I want a bicycle, and they went and bought a bicycle for her, but he didn't have any money, so he had to buy this junky bicycle. She was embarrassed to ride it around, and so he said he would fix it up for her, so he fixed it up, and he ended up getting all the rust off it and painting it in midnight blue, and then he got this other little tiny paintbrush, and he painted thousands of tiny stars on it like it was Merlin's cloak, and she rode off on it, and the next day, another little girl in the neighborhood came up and said, can you paint my bicycle the same way you did with your daughters? And then, then there was a line of kids asking him to paint their bicycles, and he did that for weeks, and then he was like, you know what, I figured out what I'm supposed to do with my life. I'm supposed to paint bicycles with my life. And he just relaxed, and then the next day he had an idea for a novel. <laughs> so the answer is, go paint bicycles. Just do something else, walk yeah. away. Walk away yeah. from the thing that's not working and, and do something mindless mm -hmm. and satisfying. Can I confess something to you? Yeah. When we leave here, I'm also, I'm stuck creatively right now. I'm working on a couple of things mm -hmm. and stuck. I'm going to go power wash my friend's driveway. Hot. It's the best. <laughs> it's the, like, it's literally, it's a medicine. Oh my God, that sounds great. It's, and you see progress. Yes. And it's like, it's, it's hypnotic progress. Yeah. It's, it's so embarrassing I for me to. I would suggest going around the neighborhood and power washing everybody's driveways for a while. Why stop with your friend? Just do that for the summer. I guarantee you something great will come out of it. <laughs> Be that guy. Yeah. Oh my God. Just be that guy. That's so embarrassing to Because it it's it's it'll so drop true. you out of the drama yeah. and into the present, and that's when the ideas start. I to borrowed the in. pressure washer from my dad. I had to go get special gas before this co our, our conversation <laughs> so that I can go do this. I'm so jealous. <laughs> I, I've called friends at times and been like, can I come and um, clean out your closets and organize your kitchen? I'm having trouble writing. Uh, so, yeah, something else. Perfect. You got it. You, it's all going to be all right. Awesome. Thank you very, very much You're for sitting welcome. down with us. Congrats on the new book. You're gonna, it's it's uh, so inspirational to read. It's so timely. It's such a powerful piece of work. So thank you. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm looking forward. I, I haven't finished the book. I wanted to sit with you first. Oh, good. I'm glad I'm I didn't like, spoil it for you. Yeah, and I, I was worried. I, I didn't want to go there. So for those folks at home, uh, go check out City Girls. Thank you so much for being a guest on the show. Really, really appreciate it. You're welcome. I loved it. Awesome. All right. See you again, probably, hopefully, <laughs> tomorrow.